And another kind of uncomfortable truth that we don't hear much of is that the majority of RCTs of interventions in rehab contain biases that broadly favor the therapy under investigation, as we saw in one of my first slides. This is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, and it's really just for the nerds, but I think you're probably all nerds. And each of these things represents a characteristic of a clinical trial. This is basically a list of ways you can design a trial to get the wrong answer, right? So when we uh, do systematic reviews of clinical trials, each of, a, each of those trials, we will assess their methods against each of these criteria. Did they randomize properly? Did they protect that randomization? Did they blind uh, participants? Could they blind the outcome assessors? Did they deal with missing data in an appropriate fashion? Have they reported all the outcomes they said they would, or are they just reporting the ones they want you to see? This is uh, it's absolutely well known and well demonstrated that studies that fail on any of these criteria will return an effect size bigger, on average, than studies that don't. So all of these biases make our treatments look better than they actually are. And that's kind of, that, that's established. You guys all should know this, or you should use this tool when you're reading a trial, or maybe the Pedro tool, just to run through the list, man, because it's a very quick uh, checklist for helping you to make sense of whether you should trust that trial or file it in the bin. But I want to talk to you about some of the other challenges that don't make this list, challenges that are a bit more infrastructural in the evidence base that I think you need to be aware of to be a good user of evidence. And the first of these is that size matters. And anyone who tries to tell you that size doesn't matter has a hidden agenda, right? Size of trials matters. Most of you who did statistics at your undergrad level will know that a small trial is underpowered to detect an effect. So small trials should be at risk of false negatives, of not finding a treatment is effective, even though it is. But there's a paradox here. Small trials that actually get published are more likely to demonstrate a much bigger effect than bigger trials. And the question is, why would that be? Because if they're underpowered, they should be false negatives. But the ones that make it into print tend to be much more optimistic than larger, better trials. And the first reason for that is this, it's publication bias, that small trials are easy to hide. So small trials that don't demonstrate a benefit for the treatment just tend not to make it into print. They're selectively filtered out of the peer review process. Now partly that might be because a very enthusiastic clinical researcher who was very vested in the treatment was very disappointed in the result, so they just filed the trial in the drawer next to their desk. But partly it might be because they tried to publish it, but it got a really hard time at peer review because the peer reviewers had a vested interest, perhaps in that treatment being shown to be effective or not ineffective. Or it might just be that it got past the peer reviewers, but the editor thought negative trials aren't sexy and they're not going to get people reading my journal. Right? But publication bias is a serious infrastructural problem. This is a great example of it. This is a funnel plot, which is, again, another nerdy thing from... from, from